Hey folks, I'm Jean Tiberio, and this is Healing Outside the Box. I'm taking a week off this week, so I'll be playing a repeat episode called The Red Squirrels vs. The Blue Squirrels. Now the title caught my eye because of the obvious political metaphor, but truth be told, it's not really about politics. And believe it or not, it's not really about squirrels. Although I do go off on a tangent for altogether too long. It's really about what squirrels eat, namely peanuts. But it's really not even about that. It's about a peanut nutritional supplement that Doctors Without Borders packs and delivers to starving children around the world. But it's really not even about the nutritional supplement. It's about the fact that a supplement made from peanuts can be delivered to just about everyone but Americans. So what it's really about is, why is that? And by that, I mean the fact that our children can no longer eat peanuts because there's so many allergies that the schools cannot offer them to our school children. And why is that? Now, I don't have all the answers, but I eventually get around to asking that key question. And I think that question is so important that I needed to ask it twice. So enjoy the episode, and I'll be back next week for another episode of Healing Outside the Box. Hey there, I'm Jean Tiberio, and I'm a nutritionist and a wellness coach. Welcome to Healing Outside the Box. Today is episode 128, and I'm calling it The Red Squirrels versus the Blue Squirrels. Now, this episode really isn't about squirrels or politics, but about what squirrels eat, namely peanuts. And it's about the political wall that they're building around the universal distribution of a peanut-containing nutritional supplement that's called Plumpy Nut. And that is about politics, or more importantly, about money. So recently, I got to thinking about squirrels. Well, actually, I got to thinking about bunny rabbits and how cute they are, because recently I saw a couple of bunny rabbits nibbling on peanuts that I had put out for them. Actually, I put them out for the birds, but the bunny rabbits came out to get them. And then I got to thinking that squirrels are not as cute as bunny rabbits, except to their mothers, I suppose. But really, I got to thinking about the food that squirrels eat, i.e. peanuts. Because peanuts can be used in addition to feeding various little creatures during the winter, they can be used to feed the world's starving children. That is, if they are not allergic to peanuts. Now, am I rambling? I don't know, it's hard to tell. But let's get back to the squirrels. Back in 2008, there was a news story in England about their squirrels that was picked up by the New York Times. I imagine back when the New York Times was trying to find things to print. The story goes something like this. The title was, Squirrels Become a New Delicacy in Britain. Now I put that title in quotation marks because the definition of a delicacy for the British could simply mean that they cut off the head of the poor little devil before putting it on a dinner plate. But we shouldn't get too uppity about this whole head thing, because I am, of course, in New England, where we put lobster on a dinner plate and call that a delicacy, antenna and little beady eyes and all. Anyway, apparently the gray squirrels, and here we're calling them blue squirrels, for the obvious political metaphor, are overpopulating all over the place in England and killing off the red squirrels that are native to England as they both fight for the same food sources. So the British are killing and eating the blue squirrels for patriotic reasons, I guess, as they are sympathetic to the plight of their native red squirrels. Now, according to this British guy named David Simpson, who is a manager of a British shop called Kingsley Village. He describes squirrels as tasting a bit like a cross between rabbit and pork. So there you have it. The patriotic British feel that eating gray or blue squirrels helps to save their native red squirrels, 
which have dwindled since their competitive gray cousins were first introduced in the 19th century. This is not unlike the Civil War, I'm thinking, when the British nearly entered the war on the side of the South. Now, I can't help thinking that maybe there's still time for the red squirrels and the blue squirrels to all get along, for heaven's sake. Anyway, on my website, which is healingoutsidethebox.com, I have a picture of an authentic Salem Common squirrel. This was established in 1629, and that would be the Salem Common, not the squirrel. In case you're interested, squirrels actually live about six years. And because I just can't help myself, I'm going to give you a little more information about squirrels. As you already know, they taste like a cross between rabbit and pork. But that's not all. Let's talk about the red squirrels. The red squirrels were common in England before the blue squirrels took over. And apparently the British are once again sympathetic to their plight. Red squirrels, like blue squirrels, eat nuts, of course but they also eat seeds, tulips, as I can attest to, berries, and insects. They have four fingers and five toes. Their coats can be red or auburn or even brown. They can be either right-handed or left-handed. I'm not sure what kind of scientist would have the responsibility of figuring that out. The babies of these squirrels are called kittens. Very cute. And last but not least, they can swim. And here's what I want to say about these sciencey guys that write this stuff. Of course they can swim. My God, they can water ski for goodness sake. Where have these sciencey guys been? There's one video of Twiggy, the water skiing squirrel, that got 2,337,000 hits on YouTube. And don't ask me how I know that. Well, truth be told, I have to take a break from watching cat videos every now and again. But let's talk about the gray squirrels. They are native to New England, where I live. These gray squirrels became common in England, as well as New England, that is, before the British started eating them. They're actually common all up and down the east coast of the United States and Canada. They are a hardy and adaptable species, as we now know. The greys have most of the characteristics of the red squirrels, but appear to do much better in cold, snowy climates like Canada and northern New England. But enough about the squirrels. This episode is actually about nuts. Now, in the late 70s, I heard a lecture about the perils of worldwide beef consumption and the toll that it will take on the environment and on our grain supply. Beef cattle eat a tremendous amount of corn, create an environmental waste management problem with both their poop and their carcasses, and pollute the air with their methane gas. And that would be from cow belching. I have a couple of episodes on the benefits of reducing beef consumption, and I'll put them in the show notes for you. It certainly made sense at the time, and that would be the 70s, to make lower meat consumption a top priority and increase our consumption of grains, nuts, and seeds as our protein source. As everyone knows, the trend has actually been in the opposite direction. Now, the government has a lot to do with this because subsidies from the federal government really take off around this period. But then in the 80s and 90s, civil wars that broke out around the world created a famine situation that the world needed to address. About a decade ago, in order to help feed the world's starving children, a French pediatrician came up with a formula for a peanut-based nutrition supplement. This supplement is called Plumpy Nut. I apologize for my grainy voice. I have a bit of a cold. So anyway, Plumpy Nut is referred to as a ready-to-use therapeutic food. It treats severe protein-calorie malnutrition and has many benefits over other sources of world hunger food supplies. One of the main benefits is that it can be given to families to take home. This can reduce the need to hospitalize these severely malnourished children. In hospitals where these fragile patients can pick up contagious diseases, they can succumb to GI illnesses or respiratory infections and not survive long enough to be refed. This plumping nut 
is easily dispensed from a durable tear-open package. It does not require adding water, which reduces the risk of these children getting sick from the contaminated water. And this is especially true, as you can imagine, in large refugee camps where the sanitation can be poor. Plumpy nut is basically a peanut butter-like paste, and it contains protein from both peanuts and skimmed milk powder. It also has carbohydrates to provide calories, peanut oil, obviously, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. It is an excellent source of vitamin E and the B vitamins, and it has a two-year shelf life and requires no refrigeration. Many years ago, 60 Minutes had an episode on Plumpy Nut, but the term came up again back in 2010 when it showed up in one of Hillary Clinton's emails. She was reviewing a list of topics that she wanted to look into further, and her exact words were, Plumpy Nut? Question mark. Plumpy Nut is distributed by Doctors Without Borders, UNICEF, and the European Commission's Humanitarian Aid Department and it can be given to any child in the most advanced stages of malnutrition. It can be given anywhere to anyone. Now, maybe you're thinking, what about peanut allergies? Well, allergies to peanuts have not been found to be a problem due to a complete lack of allergic reactions in the target populations. I can't be the only one that finds that very interesting. So why aren't there peanut allergies around the world, if it is supposedly a genetic thing? Well, that's a good question. Peanut allergies are almost non-existent in Africa. Americans obviously have a huge problem with nut allergies, as do Africans that live in America, but not Africans in Africa. The question is not, why don't Africans have peanut allergies? The question is, why do Americans in British have peanut allergies. The allergy situation in the United States is getting out of control, as many of us know. Up to 50 million Americans have some kind of allergy, and peanuts are one of the most common, if not the most common, allergy. Now, scientists haven't completely figured this out yet, but I'm sure they're speculating in their private homes, hopefully where the NSA can't listen to their conversations. But let's start with how we define an allergy. When particles of pollen, pet dander, or certain types of food enter our bodies, they're just called antigens. Normally something that's called an antigen is a protein or protein-like substance. If your body happens to have a sensitivity to that particle, it mistakes the harmless element for a dangerous invader. The particle then becomes what we call an allergen. Now, a sensitivity to a substance alone doesn't guarantee you will develop an allergy, as most people would define it. For example, when I was a teenager, I went strawberry picking in a huge field of strawberries. The owners of the farm would give you empty cork containers, and then you would go out in the field, kneel down into the strawberry bushes, and start picking strawberries. We could eat all we wanted while we picked them. So I picked one, I ate three, etc., and my arms and legs were brushing against the leaves of the strawberry bushes, which had been sprayed with pesticides probably several times, and I ate the unwashed strawberries, which I imagined had pesticide residue on them. And lo and behold, I came home, and a few hours later, I was covered in hives, especially where my arms and legs had rubbed against the strawberry leaves. One would assume that I had an allergy to strawberries, but that was incorrect. I've been eating strawberries pretty much to my heart's content since then without a single problem. Could it be that I had a reaction to whatever the heck was sprayed on those strawberries? Me think so. But let's get back to the allergens. Allergens cause your body to produce a type of antibody called immunoglobin E, basically antibodies. And these are used to identify and destroy the invaders. Unfortunately, antibodies also release histamine and other chemicals that can create an allergic reaction. Now, this isn't a big deal if your symptoms are watery eyes and a runny nose. But peanuts, as we all know, can cause a more severe allergic reaction. And it can cause the throat to swell. And that can close up your trachea. 
Technically, peanuts aren't a true nut. They're called a legume. I love saying that. And they are in the family of beans, peas, and lentils. But the proteins in peanuts are similar in structure to those in tree nuts. So people that are allergic to peanuts may also be allergic to almonds, walnuts, or cashews. Over the past 50 years, the number of children diagnosed with peanut allergies has skyrocketed. The question we need to be asking is why. And really, isn't the question to be asked, why are so many people in the Western world getting not only peanut allergies, but autoimmune diseases, gastrointestinal diseases, and autism? Autism is seen in all countries around the world, but it has skyrocketed for the Americans and the British. Scientists don't know right now, but that doesn't mean that some scientists, as I've mentioned, haven't taken a stab at a few theories. These theories all center around the possibility that what has been hurting us is either directly or indirectly gotten into our food supply. Now, I've listened to some talks on this whole subject of the rising rates of allergic reactions, and here's my opinion. These people may be experts in their specific field, whether it be, say, the medical field or the environmental sciences, but many of them are talking about the same thing, and it's the damage to our gut microbiome or our overactive immune response to substances in our environment. They pretty much all agree on one thing. This is a man-made problem, and it spreads out much more, and it's more far-reaching than just a problem with peanuts. The way I see it is that the rise in peanut allergies is like the canary in the coal mine. To many of these scientists, it seems fairly obvious what we must do. If we can't find the source of the problem, we must start from scratch and build a worldwide food supply that is based on healthy, whole-grain foods without preservatives, chemical fertilizers, and large-scale pesticides. If we want our next generation of children to thrive in this new world we're creating, we almost have to do this. And with that in mind, I would love to give a shout-out to both the red and the blue squirrels and all the people who love their children and believe that a reduced meat, plant-strong diet is the way to go, both to feed ourselves and to those less fortunate around the world. I'm including a peanut-based recipe, and I'll give you a link to it in the show notes. That's all I have for you today. Be well and stay tuned next week for another episode of Healing Outside the Box. Mm-hmm.